Hello everyone and welcome back to Mossy Bottom. On the very summit of this mountain near Loch Arrow in the heart of Ireland there's a series of stone tombs or barrows. They were constructed by the people living here some 5,000 years ago. That's before the great pyramids of Egypt were built. And today I'm going to see if I can find them and take a look for myself. This site is called Caro Keel named after the ancient townland in which it's located. On one side, Loch Arrow, on the other, the Brickleave Mountain, and all around a patchwork of fields bordered by equally ancient stone walls. Of course, I have been here once before, and most of you, I think, uh, will have seen a picture of me standing on top of this mountain with moss at my side, because that's been my profile picture on YouTube from day one. It was a really magical moment. I was looking out over the loch and Moss, as a puppy, was attempting to push me over as usual. That was four years ago and this is my first time back since. I wonder if anything's changed up there. This mountain is part of the Moitura, a site of legendary battles between the Tuatha de Danann, the ancient gods of Ireland, who have come to be known as the Fairies, and the Formorians, a race of giants and demons. And of course, legend has it that damaging or disrespecting this mountain or its tombs could incur the wrath of the Fairies and a curse upon the perpetrators. The tombs were originally excavated in 1911 by a group of archaeologists and naturalists, including an Irish man called Robert Lloyd Prager, who went on to write, I lit three candles and stood a while to let my eyes accustom themselves to the dim light. There was everything, just as the last Bronze Age man had left it, three to four thousand years before. Of course, we now know they're even older than that. He went on to say, a light brownish dust covered all. There, beads of stone, bone implements made from red deer antlers and many fragments of much decayed pottery. On little raised recesses in the wall were flat stones on which reposed the calcinated bones of young children. There's a more recent story than that of the ancient Neolithic people who built the tombs atop this mountain. And it's a story like all the very best about love. details seem to be quite vague, as with so many half-forgotten stories, but it centres around a young man and a young woman who fell in love a long time ago on the top of this very mountain. It was the only place they could safely meet, but the woman lived in a village on the east side of the mountain, the daughter of a blacksmith, and the man on a sheep farm on the west side. Their fathers were sworn enemies, as is always the case in these tales. The blacksmith claiming he hadn't been paid by the sheep farmer, and the farmer alleging the blacksmith had sold him faulty shears, which he'd more than paid for with the blood of his own injured sheep. So every day the young man would hike up this mountain between gorse and heather, telling his father that he was searching for lost sheep. And the young woman would do the same in search of wildflowers to sell to the townsfolk, which cleverly she never failed to come back with. It's said that the two young lovers would steal a kiss sat upon 
the barrows of their ancient forefathers and mothers atop the mountain. But I suspect, if this tale is true, that a lot more was stolen than a kiss. For five joyous years they met on top of this mountain, growing up together, waiting for a time when they could marry and leave their feuding fathers behind. Every summer, when the bright yellow gorse was in full bloom and the land shimmered in the morning sun, the young man would get down on one knee and propose to his beloved. And every year, the young woman would decline him. For with what, she asked, will we pay for the wedding? And where, if we were to steal away and marry, shall we then live? Anywhere, what does it matter where we live? We'd be together, he'd declare. And then in a whisper, why, we could live in these very tombs. And so she'd laugh and they'd embrace and talk happily for the hour or two they had together before retreating down the mountain once again. Until one bright morning in May, the young woman stood atop the mountain alone, for the man she loved had not come. She was surprised, for two weeks of rain had finally passed and the warm sun of late spring had at last awoken the buttercups and turned the grass from a dreary grey into a rich green. She knew it was his favourite time of year, but put it down to a mild sickness or perhaps an increased workload on his father's farm. So the next day she ascended the mountain again, eager to hear his excuse and to see him squirm apologetically at her playful rebuke. She even smiled to herself at the thought as she climbed the steep path up the eastern slope. But yet again, the young man wasn't there. She waited and waited, but he never came. So she returned the next day, and the next, and the next, but ever alone she found herself on top of that mountain. After months passed, spring became summer and summer faded into autumn. She began to regret refusing him, even though she knew that he knew that it was always her intention to accept eventually. Perhaps she couldn't help but wonder he'd grown tired of waiting for her. From the folk of her village, she heard nothing of the sheep farmer and his son on the other side of the mountain. For a feud with the local blacksmith the heart of any community runs deep. So for an entire year more, she continued to climb to the top of that mountain, at first hoping beyond hope that the young man she loved might still come back to her. And some days, if the air was clear and the mood took her, she'd sing a plaintive song, carried on the wind, wuthering through the tombs of her ancestors and far across the green hills that surrounded them. The sun may set, the seasons pass, but beneath these stars and upon this grass, I will come forevermore to wait for you, my lost amour. But that's not the end of this story. It wouldn't have passed into the annals of folklore if it was. Apparently, one day, almost exactly a year after the two young lovers last met, 
the fairy king, residing, like all his kin, in Tuatha de Danann, connected to our world through the tombs and mystical places in Ireland, heard the young woman's haunting but heartfelt song as it echoed not just across the green hills, but through the very fabric of space that connected our world to his. He emerged through these tombs, and as the young woman turned to leave, she saw him standing there, watching her. Your lover is dead, he said, but your song has touched my heart. Come with me now to my kingdom and sing for me every day as you do for him. You might think she'd be shocked to see such a figure standing there, but the existence of the fairies was well known to all who lived in or around this mountain, for it was known to be a place of significance to them. So as soon as she saw him, she knew who he was and she supposed that he spoke the truth. So broken with grief, the young woman fell to her knees. If you come with me, he said, the love you feel will never fade. You will remain as you are now forever. In grief and despair, she sobbed. No, you will forget that he has died. You will call him back to you. You will sing your plaintive aria in my halls and upon my hills forever, or until time itself wearies of hearing your words. At that, the fairy king offered his hand to the young woman. I will not ask again. So she took it, and together they walked into these tombs from which the fairy king had emerged. Never, so the story goes, to return to her village or indeed the top of this mountain again at least not in this world. Another year passed, until the following spring, the young man returned. For two long years he'd fought in a distant war, snatched away at his father's command, without the time even to beg his beloved to wait for him, or even to say a simple farewell. It had been a cold, wet and pointless war, fought in trenches against unseen enemies not dissimilar to himself. When he returned, having in his own estimation done nothing of worth, save on his final day when his leg was blown up in the act of retrieving the shattered bodies of two wounded soldiers from the battlefield, he was a different man. In all but one regard, he still loved the young woman who for five cherished years he'd met almost every day atop this mountain. But his injuries ran deep and infection set in upon his return home. So it was another three months of fighting for his life, this time in a bed atop a woolen mattress, before he was well enough to set out once again on his journey to these tombs. For two years, he dreamt of taking that old familiar path past the brightly coloured gorse bushes and patches of purple heather. And even with one gammy leg barely working, 
Nothing could stop him on that day in early September from climbing the mountain once again. But when at last he reached the top, breathless, heart pounding, but enlivened like he hadn't been for years, he found himself, as his beloved had so many times before, quite alone. There was only the wind for company. He knew this day would come. She'd been forced to marry or believed he'd betrayed her. But being a dreamer by nature, he'd still believed somehow against all hope that she'd be standing there waiting for him. And that hope never left him. For every day, just as she once had, he climbed this mountain, limping, clambering, in the hope that she might return just once to hear his apology and give her forgiveness. But all that remained of her was the distant sound of a voice, no louder than a whisper, which on the stillest of days he would swear to hearing. More years passed. The sheep farmer slipped and fell to his death one December morn, leaving unexpectedly the farm and its tiny income to the young man, who, despite his leg, which had never fully healed, assumed then the responsibility of his late father and ever tended to the small flock of sheep in his care. For the rest of his life, he remained here, never marrying and making few friends. Those who knew him said that in spite of being a bright and imaginative boy taking after his mother, who had herself died young, he had, since returning from war, assumed the temperament of his father. He barely spoke a word, at least to other men, for to his flock of sheep, to the gorse and heather, and most especially to the stones atop that mountain, he spoke plenty. Like much of the folklore that's told and written down in this part of the world, this story has a rather melancholy end. It's said the young man lived out his days as a bachelor, a tall, wiry man, lean but strong, despite his injuries. Until in his 88th year, the young man, young no longer, disappeared. A few good men whom he'd helped over the years searched the mountain for him, but found nothing. One whose own daughter had once been found and saved by the sheep farmer during a terrible storm even entered the tombs, a feared place by the local people. But still, no trace was found, not in the tombs, nor upon the hills, nor in the very house of the missing man. Some say he slipped and fell to his death as his father had. For the gorse and heather are deep, and the wet rocks sometimes treacherous. And it's widely believed that the manner in which a man dies is fated in some way by the demise of his father. So folks supposed it to be inevitable that he too would meet his end upon this mountain. After all, he had climbed it every day, even unto his final year, when tourists had begun to come and ask in the surrounding pubs and inns about the strange old man standing alone atop the tombs, silent as if waiting or searching or remembering. Was he mad? Had he lost his mind? Was the figure even real? Had they imagined him? But the few who knew him knew better, for it was May in which he disappeared. After two long weeks of rain, the clouds had finally parted and the warm sun of late spring had at last awoken the buttercups and turned the grass from a dreary grey into a rich green. The sun shone bright and the rocks of the mountain were dry underfoot. He knew that path too well, they said, far too well to slip, not on a day like that for his body might have been failing, but his mind was as sharp as ever it had been. And he knew where to tread, and moreover, where not to. Besides, had he slipped, we'd have found him. Then one remembered the young woman who disappeared in much the same mysterious way some 70 years earlier. They searched for weeks, he said, but no body ever was found. In May it was too, and she was but a lass of 18, don't tell me a young, strong girl like that slipped to her death too. It was
was agreed that the mountain was a strange place, likely cursed by those that rested within it, and best avoided, lest they too should meet the same fate. And in time, the old man, just like the young woman before him, was consigned to folklore. Shall I tell you what I think? After all those years, he finally found a way through. Okay folks, the sun is setting, it's time to go home. Back to my animals, back to moths. Thank you as always for watching, subscribing and supporting the channel. This has been a really fun video to shoot and didn't we get lucky with the weather. From me here on Karakil Mountain to you wherever you are in the world, take care and bye for now. <laughs>